Yo, this is Old Culture. I am Ryan Peverly, and holy shit, it's 2017. Happy New Year to those of you choosing to live under the man-made construct of time. For those of you who've chosen otherwise, good day to you. You have my deepest admiration. Either way, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for being here. I'm glad you stopped by to hang out with me in my little corner of the world here, because this episode I'm chatting up with Dr. Jerry Brown, co-author of The Psychedelic Gospels, The Secret History of Hallucinogens in Christianity. Jerry's going to share some research he and his wife and co-author Julie have done that show evidence of psychedelics in early and medieval Christian art, particularly the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Our conversation is coming up in just a few moments, but first, let's just kick it for a bit. You know, I'm not a New Year's resolution kind of guy, but I am a daily resolution kind of guy. I think that's more practical. I'm not waiting on anything to make any changes in my life. If I want to do something, I'm just going to do it. Too many people out here are waiting on certain times to do things instead of just doing them. Too many people are postponing changes because they're too lazy to do them. Living life that way, well, that's not really living life if you're waiting around for things to change. I saw a poem floating around on Twitter today, and I wanted to share it with you. It's from Huang Shen, a Chinese painter who lived from 1687 to 1772. It's just a little five-line poem, and this is what it says. I want this year to be my renaissance, a rebirthing of my dreams. Like painting poetry, I want to feel again. I wanted to share that poem because of that last line, I want to feel again. Yeah, I'm not a time or a calendar guy, but if 2016 taught me anything, it's that there are still a lot of people out there that can't feel, that aren't feeling. Now, folks who roll in the conspiracy community like to say people have been dumbed down by the system, and that definitely appears to be true. But at the same time, a lot of people, a lot of good people with a lot of love inside of them, they've been numbed down as well. And I've had the pleasure of meeting some of them. And you might say, well, how is meeting someone who's numb and can't feel anything a pleasurable experience? And on the surface, yeah, it's not too pleasurable right now in this moment. It's actually pretty fucking frustrating. But the pleasure will come in that moment when the numbness goes away and they begin to feel again. The pleasure will come from being with them when that moment happens. And you want to talk about a psychedelic reality-bending experience? Try that one out. Try loving someone who can't feel their own love, or anger, or sadness, or joy. And then try being patient enough to wade through your own feelings, your own frustrations. Try being patient enough to wait for that moment when they open their heart and begin to feel everything again. You'll feel that change in them and around them, that energetic shift in their own self-awareness. You'll see how quickly it makes over their face and improves their posture. You'll notice how vibrant their voice is and how light their laugh is and how sure their steps are and how satisfied their smile is. My daily resolution today and every other day that I wake up fortunate enough to make a resolution is that I want to feel. I want to be more real because this world has become entirely too artificial from the food we eat to the air we breathe to the way we communicate and I personally fell victim to that for a long time but right now I choose to feel. I think that's something we should all strive for today tomorrow, and every other day and moment that we're granted here together. This reminds me of, well, it reminds me of a couple of things, actually. First, it's that alchemical transmutation you read so much about in occultism. It's starting at the base and working your way up, lead to gold. It's moving from darkness into the light. But the only way to start that journey is by accepting your own darkness and then choosing to enter it. And the folks who can't feel 
they've chosen to ignore this part of themselves, to overlook it, because it is dark and it is scary. And this darkness is that little tiny room inside of you that you're afraid to enter because it's pitch black and unknown, but enter it you must. This also reminds me of a passage from one of my favorite novels, House of Leaves by Mark Z. Danielewski. Some of you may be familiar with it. It's a little long, this passage, but it goes a little something like this. This much I'm certain of. It doesn't happen immediately. You'll finish, and that will be that, until a moment will come, maybe in a month, maybe a year, maybe even several years. You'll be sick, or feeling troubled, or deeply in love, or quietly uncertain, or even content for the first time in your life. It won't matter. Out of the blue, beyond any cause you can trace, you'll suddenly realize things are not how you perceive them to be at all. For some reason, you will no longer be the person you believed you once were. You'll detect slow and subtle shifts going on all around you. More importantly, shifts in you. Worse, you'll realize it's always been shifting. Like a shimmer of sorts. A vast shimmer. Only dark like a room. But you won't understand why or how. You'll have forgotten what granted you this awareness in the first place. Old shelters, television, magazines, movies won't protect you anymore. You might try scribbling in a journal on a napkin, maybe even in the margins of this book. That's when you'll discover you no longer trust the very walls you always took for granted. Even the hallways you've walked a hundred times will feel longer, much longer, and the shadows, any shadow at all, will suddenly seem deeper, much, much deeper. You might try then, as I did, to find a sky so full of stars it will blind you again. Only no sky can blind you now. Even with all that iridescent magic up there, your eye will no longer linger on the light. It will no longer trace constellations. You'll care only about the darkness and you'll watch it for hours, days, maybe even for years, trying in vain to believe you're some kind of indispensable, universe-appointed sentinel, as if just by looking, you could actually keep it all at bay. It will get so bad you'll be afraid to look away. You'll be afraid to sleep. Then no matter where you are, in a crowded restaurant or on some desolate street, or even in the comforts of your own home, You'll watch yourself dismantle every assurance you ever lived by. You'll stand aside as a great complexity intrudes, tearing apart piece by piece all of your carefully conceived denials, whether deliberate or unconscious. And then for better or worse, you'll turn unable to resist, though try to resist you still will, fighting with everything you've got not to face the thing you most dread, What is now, what will be, what has always come before, the creature you truly are, the creature we all are, buried in the nameless black of a name. And then the nightmares will begin. That's the end of the passage. And the process described in there is a process that I went through recently. I'm still going through it, to be honest. I can pinpoint the exact moments in my timeline where these shifts occurred. And the way Danielewski describes it in this passage, that's exactly how it started. I realized things were shifting in me, around me, and that they'd always been shifting, and that I had been resisting these shifts. I'd been caught in this vortex of swirling, spiraling energy, and I was trying to fight it. And I'd been fighting it my entire life, maybe even for lifetimes. And then one day, in one moment, I decided to just let go. I gave myself to it, I turned myself over to it, and I plunged into the abyss, into my own darkness, and I chose to face myself for the first time. There were a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of dreams that haunted me for days, sometimes weeks, and being awake wasn't any better, because I couldn't feel anything, I was robotic. I'd say I was going through the motions, but there wasn't any motion, it was just still. And then somehow, out of the blue, beyond any cause I could trace... The light just turned on, and I felt everything so clearly. I saw everything so clearly. I had shifted again to see myself clearly for the first time. I saw how quickly this shift made over my own face and improved my own posture. I noticed how vibrant my own voice was, how light my own laugh was, how sure my own steps were, and how satisfied my own smile was. And in that moment, I made my first daily resolution. To allow myself to feel everything, to be more real, to stop being someone that I wasn't and embrace who I am and what I'm meant to do, where I'm meant to go and who I'm meant to go there with. 
And it's been the best decision I've ever made, the best resolution I've ever made. Because once I granted myself that awareness, that freedom, I realized I was able to help others find this same awareness and this same freedom within themselves. And that's really what all of these resolutions amount to anyway. Granting yourself the freedom to pursue yourself and then holding others accountable while they do the same. Now again, I'm not a time guy, I'm not a calendar guy, but numbers are important. And I want to share one last thing with you before we get to my conversation with Dr. Jerry Brown. In numerology, 2016 is a nine year. Two plus zero plus one plus six is nine. Nine is a number of endings and completion. There's a cycle, there's a pattern that ended in 2016. And 2017 is a one year. Two plus zero plus one plus seven is ten. Reduce that down to one. One is a number of new beginnings, new creations. We're being called right now, in this moment, to create a new life for ourselves. But if we resist, whatever's out there, God, the universe, however you want to label it, if we resist it, it will push this change on you, whether you like it or not, because it's time to change. That's what's happening now, and that's what's always been happening. Anyway, thank you for indulging me up front here. Again, thank you very much for being here. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Jerry Brown. Psychedelic. I'm here with Dr. Jerry Brown. Jerry, thanks for your time. It's my pleasure. You know, before we get into the content of the Psychedelic Gospels, uh, who is Dr. Jerry Brown, Ph.D., and why did you pursue this project in the first place? Well, I'm an anthropologist by training. I did my graduate work at Cornell University. I did my uh, field work back in the late 60s with Cesar Chavez and the farm workers, and wrote a dissertation on why they were so successful, and also ended up uh, serving as the uh, one of the coordinators of the national and international grape boycotts. Um, after that, I came to uh, Miami, and uh, after I completed my PhD in anthropology, um, was offered a position at a new university at that time in 1972, Florida International University, where I served as a founding professor of anthropology from 1972 to 2014 when I retired. So that's, um, that's my background. Uh, I've been involved in a variety of interdisciplinary research uh, projects. And back in um, the mid-70s, after my first somewhat traumatic LSD experience at the Rainbow Family Gathering uh, near Strawberry Lake in Colorado, uh, I decided I want to know a lot more about psychedelics. 
and I decided to design and teach a course on it. So I designed a course called Hallucinogens and Culture, uh, which I taught continuously uh, at Florida International University from uh, mid-70s until um, I retired from the university. Uh, the first part of the course went into the ancient and classical use of psychedelics, which I prefer to call entheogens, and within bio, god, dios, gen, generate, uh, plants and chemicals that generate a sense of the divine within. So we looked at the tribal uh, and, and uh, first people shamanism and the use of psychedelics there. We looked at the use of uh, entheogens, uh, soma in the Hindu Rig Veda, uh, another form of um, LSD-like fungi in the Eleusinian Mysteries of Greece. And then I went on to look at the modern mind explorers, or people I like to call the psychonauts of the 20th century. Uh, everyone from Leary to McKenna to um, Stanislav Grof, who's probably the greatest uh, mind explorer of, uh, of modern times. And um, that, that was the course. In 2006, during an anniversary trip to Scotland, my wife and co-author, Julie Brown, who took all of the spectacular photos in our book, uh, went to Roslyn Chapel in Scotland. We were drawn there because of references to Roslyn in Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code, as a possible resting place uh, for the Holy Grail. But while there, we made, uh, I made a spectacular discovery of a psychoactive Amanita muscaria mushroom uh, sculpted into the head of the most prominent green man of Roslyn Chapel. And even though Roslyn is a Catholic chapel, uh, it is also replete with pagan symbolism. So it's uh, part pagan, part uh, Catholic. And I'm wondering why did Sir William St. Clair here in the 15th century put psychoactive mushrooms uh, into this Catholic Church, and then really started speculating wildly. What does this imply for Catholicism? Were there psychoactive plants uh, used in medieval times? What about the history and origins of Catholicism? Started speculating wildly. And then the words of my symbolic anthropology professor, Victor Turner at Cornell, good theory comes from good field work. In other words, go out and gather the facts. And Julie and I also took some guidance from the words of the astrophysicist Carl Sagan, uh, who said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And without a doubt, claiming that psychedelics are involved in the history and, and uh, the origins of Christianity is an extraordinary claim. So we set out on a research journey throughout Europe and the Middle East, visiting churches and cathedrals, looking for evidence of psychedelic uh, images in the artwork. By that I mean in the frescoes, in the illuminated Bibles, in the stained glass windows, in the mosaics, in the sculpture. And we found in the nine cases we visited uh, so much evidence that we eventually uh, gave rise, we generated the theory of the psychedelic gospel saying, look, there's an alternative gospel being depicted in the artwork. As Pope Gregory said in the sixth century, uh, after the end of the Dark Ages, that art is the Bible for the illiterate. So here in this artwork, whoever created it is telling us that there is a story about psychedelics involved in Christianity, and that gave rise to our theory, which we believe is a different approach, uh, an alternative history of Christianity to the one found in the New Testament, uh, in the Gospels of the New Testament. Well, we'll get into some of the art in a minute. I, I first want you to maybe touch on or tell the story of R. Gordon Wasson because he he plays a large role in not only your book but also the psychedelic movement in general. Could you maybe touch on his yeah. story and, and how it impacted your research? Without a doubt. R. Gordon Wasson is the father of modern mycology, especially ethnomycology, mycology from the Greek mycos, uh, mushrooms, mycology being the study of mushrooms, and ethnomycology, the way in which different cultures uh, use mushrooms. And he has uh, written and researched, uh, he was a former uh, J.P. Morgan banker, and out of his marriage to a uh, white Russian who fled the Russian Revolution, uh, Valentina, 
uh, he re- they realized that they came from different cultures. He from a kind of an English speaking world that uh, was was fearful or looked at mushrooms as associated with toadstools, decay, witches, the underworld, and she from a Slavic culture that embraced and adored mushrooms. And out of that conversation uh, grew decades of research uh, and the major some of some of the major milestones in Wasson's uh, stupendous writings and discoveries were the identification of the enigmatic plant, the soma plant that is praised in one of the mandalas of the Hindu Rig Veda, one of the world's oldest religious texts written down in the Sanskrit about uh, 4,000 years ago, uh, is in praise of soma. Wasson identified soma as the Amanita muscaria mushroom. He also traced its roots back to the ancient reindeer herders of Siberia who had a reindeer herder mushroom uh, shamanic complex that uh, we argue in the book uh, gave rise to all of the themes of our modern Santa Claus story. He teamed up, Wasson teamed up with Albert Hoffman who synthesized LSD uh, in its laboratory in Sandoz, uh, Switzerland, at Sandoz Laboratories in, in Switzerland in 1938. Uh, before he realized what it actually was. He teamed up with him and Karl Rook, a classical Greek scholar, uh, to unveil the mystery of Eleusis, this practice that went on for 2,000 years in ancient Greece from 1500 B.C. to 500 A.D. when Christianity became the official religion of the Catholic Church as a fungi that grew on the, on the barley and the grains outside of the temple uh, to Demeter uh, in Eleusis. And he also found a living mushroom cult among the Mazatec of Mexico. Uh, And he wrote another phenomenal book called The Wondrous Mushroom. So Wasson is really both the uh, founder of modern ethnomycology and uh, the unwitting and and unsuspecting um, father or or one of the founders of the modern psychedelic movement because uh, people uh, took his work as a kind of uh, legitimacy to both study and explore uh, psychedelics. So Wasson is a prime figure in this, and we, uh, the first part of our book is really uh, an exploration of his work. But then we ask right up front in the beginning of the book, why did Wasson, who was such an indefatigable and relentless researcher, why did he stop researching psychedelics? Why didn't he go past the portals of the church? Why did he not pursue his theory into the hallowed halls of Christianity? And in the book, we discover why he didn't do so, because he found evidence of a giant psychoactive mushroom that's in one of the images that we photographed in our book in the tiny chapel of Plain Corralt in central France that is obviously an Amanita muscaria mushroom, but he fled from that and he denied it was an Amanita, that the use of psychoactive mushrooms in the Judeo-Christianity stopped a thousand years before the birth of Christ. And we pursued this theory into Christianity and we dispute Wasson on this key point. Do you think his ties to the banking industry, the financial industry, maybe impacted where he stopped his research then? Uh, There is no doubt about that. And in a chapter uh, called The Pope's Banker, we reveal um, the extent of those ties. And we invite you and your listeners to explore that chapter, which is one of the biggest revelations in the book uh, that showed why, why there was a financial reason why Wasson uh, did not pursue his theory um, despite obvious evidence of psychedelics in Christian art. So your book does deal primarily with the art itself, but before we get into that, is there any evidence of psychedelics in any ancient religious texts? Yes, without a doubt. We found those in the Hindu Rig Veda, which is one of the world's oldest religious texts and one of the world's great religions. And uh, the Hindu Rig Veda uh, has a, it's a giant poem, psych, poetic cycle. Um, and one mandala of the ten mandalas that make up the, the Rig Veda, which was 
uh, came from an oral tradition, was written down in the Sanskrit about um, 4,000 years ago. And when it was translated, the Rig Veda, into the German, French, and English about 200 years ago, people marveled at its majesty. But they were puzzled by the description of Soma, which was both a god, a plant, and the juice of that plant. Because Soma, as described in the Rig Veda, was a strange plant indeed. It had no leaves, it had no bark, it had no branches, it had no visible seeds. What manner of plant could this be? So here, uh, and, and Wasson uh, broke the code of Soma as a psychoactive uh, mushroom, that red and white Amanita mushroom that you'll find uh, in some in, in Christmas displays with Santa Claus. You'll find it in Scandinavian folk tales. Uh, you'll find it in Super Mario. Uh, in the in the Super Mario video game, you find the uh, the mushroom popping up to give uh, the Mario Brothers the power they need to to, to go on. So this is uh, one ancient work where you definitely find this. Uh, we've also traced it into the Eleusinian Mysteries. And uh, there's a small section of our book that we call Entheogenic Egypt that could be an entire book in itself where we talk about and show some uh, interesting photos of uh, entheogens, in this case, uh, datura plants and amanitas in ancient, ancient Egypt. Yeah, it's a fascinating chapter or section of a chapter to read. Is there also a tie between these these entheogens and the book of Ezra and the King James Version? Uh, absolutely. In fact, what happens here was that um, what, what happens in, in, in this, this process is that we, we're there at Roslyn Chapel, and we've, we've kind of discovered the green man, and we're wondering if there are any other any other signs of this? And, and we're back at the hotel, and Julie um, is looking. There is one quote that is carved on the apprentice pillar in Roslyn that says in Latin, I'll give you the English version, wine is strong, the king is strong, women are stronger still, but truth conquers all. And it comes from Ezra 1 in the King James Version of the Bible. And Julie decided to see if there were any clues, and looking into it, she found in Ezra 2, um, she said, the, the, Ezra says that he was commanded by the on high to a voice calling him Ezra, and I'm quoting now from our book on uh, the Green Man of Rosin Chapel, open thy mouth and drink, that I give thee to drink. And I then opened I my mouth, and behold, he reached me a full cup, which was full, as it were, with water, but the color of it was like fire. And I took it and drank, and when I had drunk of it, my heart uttered understanding, and wisdom grew in my breast, for my spirit strengthened, and my mouth opened and shut no more. And he goes on to describe these, you know, water, the color of fire, the spring of understanding, the wisdom fountain of wisdom, the stream of knowledge, these could easily be poetic analogies in the King James Version of the Bible for the juice of the Amanita muscaria mushroom. So that was the, the catalyst that Julie and I found at Roslyn Chapel um, that uh, led us to, to think, look, there are allusions here, not only from the ancient Hindu writings, not only from the Eleusinian mysteries of Greece, but right there in scripture. And one of the things we do in the book, because there is no data book Christian art before two, the year 200 AD, so we had to go back and look at the canonical Gospels, the Gospel of Mark and Matthew and Luke and John, and also look into the Gnostic Gospels through what we call Soma eyes, through psychedelic eyes, trying to see if passages, enigmatic passages, passages that didn't make sense, unless you interpreted them within the ethnobotanical framework of psychedelics, they wouldn't make sense. And so we reinterpret these passages, uh, especially in the chapter in our book called Kingdom of Heaven, uh, to make the case for psychedelics, uh, even in the origins of Christianity, and uh, by, by revisiting the 
King James Version of the Bible. So you mentioned you make this discovery at Roslyn Chapel in Scotland, and this sets you off on this journey where you're traveling throughout Europe, you're visiting castles and churches, and let's go through that, that journey then. You're, you start at, in central France, and you have to help me pronounce some of these words maybe, but you visited, is it Plain Corralt? Is that how you say it? Yes, Plain Corralt. So, I mean, in broad brushes, and there's a map of the, of the churches and sacred sites we visited, uh, Roslyn Chapel in Scotland, Canterbury Cathedral in England, Chartres Cathedral in France, and several chapels and churches in center of France, the Chapel of Plain Corral, the Abbey of saint Sauvin, the Church of Saint-Martin-de-Vic in France. Uh, we go on to St. Michael's Church in Hildesheim, Germany, uh, the Basilica of Aquileia in Italy. We toured and visited all 57 uh, rooms in the Vatican Museum, uh, on to the Eleusinian Mysteries at the archaeological uh, site of Eleusis that still is visible today outside of Athens and Greece, uh, onto the dark churches in the cave churches of uh, Gorome and the Alhara Valley in, uh, in Turkey, and then um, looked also at uh, Egyptian sources. But the next big stop was really Plain Corralt in France, where there is a giant Amanita mushroom as tall or a little taller than Adam and Eve uh, painted on the wall of this tiny chapel. It's about 60 feet uh, deep by 20 feet wide. And instead of there being the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there's Adam and Eve flanking this giant Amanita mushroom with the snake coiled around the stem of the mushroom, uh, offering them, offering Eve a piece of the mushroom, and Adam and Eve are covering themselves, not with fig leaves, but with mushroom caps. And it's this kind of discovery and interpretation on close personal inspection that really gave us the evidence that we needed to be able uh, to, to begin to build this theory of the psychedelic gospels. And, and let me say, it's very difficult to simply look at these images online uh, because sometimes they're corrupted sometimes they're not clear uh, but to see them up close and personal to take high uh, resolution photographs of them which are reprinted in the book and and the, you know 30 pages of color inserts are really um, what makes this book uh, special in many ways so plain corral was a focal point of our discovery because Boston visited this back in 1952 and he fled from what he found there. Your contention is that maybe the forbidden fruit in the Bible is actually a mushroom then, right? Yes, and, and, and this is quite amazing. Um, for, for, you know, if we just pause for a minute, uh, Ryan, and think about Genesis, the book of Genesis, uh, which I really encourage all of your listeners to go and reread because it's amazing. So here uh, God creates Adam, then he creates Eve, he puts them in the Garden of Eden, they have everything they need, and he says, you know, you of everything you may enjoy, you may have dominion over all the fruits and the animals, and of every plant you may eat, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is growing in the center. For if you eat of that, then verily ye shall die. Now it's interesting, because as we all know, Eve was seduced by the serpent. Here starts the battle of the sexes um, to, to eat of the fruit. Uh, she convinces Adam that it's good and he eats of it. Now God is angry. All right. But interestingly enough, God does not kill them. Why did God not keep his word after they violated the one fundamental taboo that he told them? Was he secretly proud that his creation had used their free will to access the plants that he had created, the entheogenic plants, to achieve cosmic consciousness and broad awareness? And also, 
God says later on, and, and again, this is why Genesis is so fascinating, because he, it talks about, and I won't dwell on this, the sons of um, God met the daughter, the sons of, of God met the daughters of man and found them fair. Well, who are these sons? I mean, this is the Old Testament. This is one God. This is monotheism. We're not yet at the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So, so who is this one God? I mean, who are these sons of God? You know, enigmatic passage. And then he says, and what if they eat of the tree of immortality and become as unto us? So our contention, and this was really Julie's insight, is that these trees at the center of Eden, the tree of, of knowledge and opening up the portal to, to cosmic awareness, and the tree of immortality are, are one tree. And it's not an apple tree. There is never anywhere in Genesis the fruit of the tree described as an apple tree as it's come down to us through the modern telling of, of the Eden myth. And we believe that, um, and Watson also had, came to this conclusion later on in his work, because this was Genesis. This was way before, uh, a thousand years before Christ, uh, that it is uh, the Amanita Muscaria, and that at the beginning of our biblical tradition is uh, a hidden uh, psychoactive plant, which was repressed and suppressed with the coming of monotheism, which is a different kind of religion than, sh than shamanism or, or paganism, obviously. Yeah, and it might be a good time to interject here, too, just because we're touching on it a little bit, but you mentioned in this chapter where you're talking about this temptation scene in Plain Coral that a uh, noted scholar of the Dead Sea Scrolls, John Marco Allegro, contends that Jesus did not exist as a historical figure and was instead a symbol for the mushroom itself. Did you find any credence to that claim? No. Um, first of all, I want to say that John Marco Allegro, who wrote The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, and he was in a big debate with Wasson, and we call that debate the Battle of the Trees. You know, is Plain Coralt a tree, or is it a mushroom? And I want to commend Allegro because he was one of the first scholars, and he was an eminent Dead Sea Scroll scholar, and he was on the team of, uh, selected to be on the team of scholars to interpret, uh, preserve, and bring forth to the public the phenomenal find of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So he really knew what he was talking about. Um, and he included the Amanita Muscaria of Plain Keralt on the cover of one edition of his book. So hats off to Allegro for this. However, we disagree fundamentally with Allegro uh, in his conclusions. Uh, we do not believe, we believe that Jesus was historical figure. Number two, while Allegro bases his claim that Jesus did not exist and was simply a metaphor for the Amanita muscaria mushroom on dubious linguistic evidence, in other words, interpreting ancient words in other languages and in the Bible and, and filling in interpretations and even linguistic scholars have said, you know, this just does not stand up. Instead of using dubious linguistic evidence, we use very visible artistic evidence that is so specific that scholars can, and botanists can even identify what species of psychoactive plants are being depicted in the Christian art. And also, unfortunately, Legro had an axe to grind against the church. He was sort of they believed that his work was going to liberate people from the thrall of a false religion. And Julie and I uh, simply cannot buy that. Uh, we think that Jesus is a remarkable teacher, that Catholicism is a beautiful religion and the principles espoused by the Pope and Catholics throughout the world of, of social justice and compassion are, are really um, a light, you know, and have been a light through the ages uh, to the world. And we are not trying to challenge or destroy any of the fundamental uh, beauty of Christianity, but rather to reintroduce it to a secret uh, that was embedded in early Christian lore and that 
we believe is a mystery that is found in many of the world's religions. So while we applaud Allegro for his early research, we reject his fundamental conclusions and approach. Now, after playing Kuralt, you venture to the Church of St. Martin, also in central France, and here you make a, a very thought-provoking discovery about a piece called Christ's Entry into Jerusalem and also about the Last Supper as well. What was that about? Well, uh, basically, uh, we enter this uh, tiny parish church of St. Martin de Vic, about a two-hour's drive from Plain Coralt in central France. And uh, the artwork in there is magnificent. I mean, it really is, as the plaque outside the church says, a work of genius. Uh, the, the beauty of the drawings, the angel figures, etc., are, are just in their own right magnificent to behold. Uh, as we went into the choir, uh, Julie uh, took my hand and we were looking at this fresco showing uh, Isaiah, and also uh, in the same fresco, combining both Old Testament and New Testament, um, almost a wall-length uh, depiction of uh, Christ entering Jerusalem. And as we looked at this, Julie says, do you see what I see? And over the heads, and this is in plate six of our book, over the heads of the joyful youth who are greeting uh, Jesus riding the donkey into Jerusalem with his disciples walking behind him, one of the youth's hand is wrapped around the stem of one of five smooth tan psilocybin mushrooms, very large caps. The, the caps are about the width of the youth's head. Um, this was a stunning discovery for us, and as we looked Towards the next wall, there on top of the towers of Jerusalem were uh, men cutting down with long knives, cutting through the stems of psilocybin mushrooms, which we, over the painting of the Last Supper, and the same kind of knives, the same mushroom caps are found on the table in the Last Supper. And if you look closely as we did, you will find mushroom caps cleverly depicted and drawn into the hems of several of the disciples, clearly visible under the table of this. So that was the point where we had this aha moment, and it was almost as if the frescoes were speaking to us. Uh, the bells were pealing. We felt almost transported back to medieval times, and we, we had this aha moment. This is a psychedelic gospel. There's another story of, um, of Jesus, of early Christianity, that's being told here. Absolutely. But still, as you reflected on this aha moment and these visits to these places in central France, you do speculate in the book that, you know, maybe these artworks could have been created by a heretical cult, you know, deep in the forests of central France, and that it was necessary then to travel north to sites from medieval Christianity. Where did that journey take you next then? Yes, so, so yeah, I mean, you, the point is well taken. Okay, so we, we, we visited here in central France the chapel of Plain Corral, the Abbey of saint Sauvin, and this parish church. And they were all within a couple of hours' drive of each other. And so we asked ourselves, well, maybe this is a renegade, um, you know, cult of priests far from the king and the church who are uh, practicing uh, a, a form of psychedelic uh, Christianity, uh, but it's marginal, as some people have argued. It's, 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 if the theogens are in Christianity, it's only a cultish or a marginal phenomenon. So the next question we asked ourselves is, would we find evidence of psychedelics, of entheogens, in the high holy places of Christianity, in Chartres Cathedral, uh, southwest of Paris in France, in Canterbury in England, and in St. Michael's Church in Hildesheim, Germany, which was built by Bishop Bernward, who was a tutor to the uh, Holy Roman Emperor and who eventually himself became a saint of the Catholic Church. And indeed we did which 
caused us to reach several conclusions. One, unlike some people contend, is that this was not suppressed in early Christianity or medieval Catholicism. This was practiced in secret. It was for the initiates of the clergy and probably for the pagan royalty. But secrecy is not suppression. And all of these shamanic rites, whether you look among the Mazatec of Mexico or the Conibo of the Amazon or the, um, uh, uh, the, the early Greeks, uh, the founders of Western civilization in the Eleusinian mysteries, this was always practiced in secrecies with taboos about telling people what you experience in these entheogenic sacred rituals. So we make the very strong point that secrecy is not suppression. This was not suppressed. It's very visible. And number two, it was prevalent not only in small, um, secluded, rural uh, churches. It was found in the very centers and the high holy places of Christendom. Which discoveries at these high holy places really stood out to you? I mean, they're all significant, but which ones really stood out to you as, I guess, maybe proof that your theory of the psychedelic gospels is correct? Well, uh, let me start with Chart Cathedral, where nearly 10% of the stained glass windows, which come from the uh, 12th century uh, after the church was rebuilt, after the Cathedral of Chartres was rebuilt several times, actually, through its history uh, due to, to fires. And in um, there's about 176 magnificent stained glass windows on two roll, rows, one of sort of the, the floor level and then uh, on the higher levels of the church. So you kind of walk through this cathedral and you're, you're bathed in golden light and the light that is reflected for these magnificent, well-preserved uh, stained glass windows. Let me just talk about one of them. In the um, and, and there are windows carry the name of the saint or the Bible story. So you may have the Mary Magdalene window, where Mary discovers that, that Jesus has left um, the sepulcher after his death. I want to focus on the conversion of Placidus, in the St. Eustace window, where, where Placidus becomes St. Eustace. And as we look up at his moment of illumination, there is coming down from some angelic figure on high a red light of illumination that's coming into his forehead. And he is surrounded uh, to his left and to his right by psychoactive mushrooms. And the cross that he is praying to is framed by the antlers of a stag, of a deer. And we've talked about this ancient shamanic reindeer herder um, Amanita muscaria complex that comes out of uh, central Eurasia. So this was one of the dramatic pieces of evidence. I could go on to describe uh, the others that we found throughout Chart Cathedral. And it took us like two days to photograph there uh, because it is so extensive and expansive. The second place we went was to find the Great Canterbury Psalter, which is an illuminated manuscript, a Bible that was created, the first part of it was created in England at the Canterbury Scriptorum, where Bibles were made around um, 1200, maybe 1180 to 1200 A.D. That illuminated manuscript um, disappeared for over a hundred years and then it resurfaces in Spain where a different artist completed it. But the first hundred pages and the initial folios of it contain multiple images of psychoactive mushrooms. Let me mention two. The f and and uh, this, the, the, this was a leather bound very large manuscript with jewels on the original uh, binding, which leads to the speculation that it was made for maybe the King of England or the King of France. But in any case, the first uh, several folios of it contain, uh, each of them contain 12 miniature drawings. So the first folio 
is Genesis. And it takes you all from the very beginning of the creations, creation to Cain and Abel and to Adam and Eve's expulsion from Eden. In the third uh, plate, in the third uh, miniature, in this first folio or page of the Canterbury uh, Psalter, you see God creating plants. And when you look at it, those plants are four psychoactive mushrooms, including a red psilocybin mushroom. And um, this image is iconic. I mean, it, it graces the cover of several books. It is also the image that is on the cover of our book. And then a blue psilocybin mushroom, because psilocybin, when exposed to air, takes on, a, oxidizes, takes on a characteristic uh, blue uh, tinge. And in the very next fourth plate, where God um, is dividing the heavens and the earth, there are plants separate from the mushrooms. So the artist is telling you, telling us, hey, we know the difference between plants and psychoactive mushrooms, and we're showing you them here. Uh, later on, in um, a folio three, where we're talking about the mission of Jesus after he is baptized by John the Baptist, the healing of the leper, uh, this is such a fascinating uh, piece because Jesus is standing with his hand on the leper's head and um, in this panel, and he's laying his hands on the leper and performing a healing ceremony. And the scroll in the leper's left hand translates, Master, if you want, you may cleanse me. Now, curiously, the scroll is not directed because the scroll has the Latin script on it, which tells you the, the saying that the person is making, is not directed toward Jesus, but points and merges with the stem of a tan psilocybin mushroom at the base of the panel. And in turn, Jesus is holding a scroll in his left hand that extends to the back of the leper saying, I want to be cleansed. In other words, the master, Jesus, is saying, I want to heal you. I, I, I will cleanse you. So the artist is making a direct link between Jesus' healing ministry and the miracles he performed and the curing power of sacred mushrooms. And I want to point out that, you know, throughout the shamanic world, uh, our, our hunting and gathering forefathers for whom shama shamanism was a, obviously not a centralized but a very decentralized belief system, the use of psychoactive plants in healing was an integral part of those ceremonies. So it was these kinds of findings and this kind of, of scrutiny um, that led us uh, to our conclusions. And, and just to give you a sense, I mean, we really had to combine, um, and, and anthropology is by nature an interdisciplinary field. So we had to combine uh, in our scholarship theology, iconography, the study of images, anthropology, ethnobotany, textual analysis, Latin translation, plus our own travelogue and adventure story to pull all of the pieces together and to interpret it uh, correctly. And I think um, it takes an interdisciplinary approach. Uh, the theologians alone, art historians alone, botanists alone are not going to put all the pieces of uh, the puzzle together. And it was fortunate that Julie had a very keen eye and a sense of aesthetics, and that I had, uh, after studying this field for 40 years, enough of a background to understand what we were seeing. Absolutely. And you also made an important discovery at St. Michael's in Germany. I, I want to skip over that because we're short on time here, because I, I want to I have a few more questions that I want to get to. Uh, but people can go read about St. Michael's in the book, obviously. That's a pretty significant discovery uh, in, regarding the transfiguration of Jesus. Um, but let's let's skip ahead. You know, they say all roads lead to Rome, and in this case, the Vatican. But what you discovered here, or maybe didn't discover, is just as telling as anything else you've seen on this trip. What did you see at the Vatican Museums? Um, when we... We went to Rome and we asked ourselves, um, you know, are we going to find evidence here in the greatest repository of Christian art in the world, the Vatican Museums? Now, unfortunately, the artwork uh, there only goes back to about the 13th or 14th century. And what we found 
had we assiduously went through all 57 rooms uh, in the Vatican uh, museums was no evidence of entheogens. And we also, you know, came to the realization that it was during the period of the Inquisition, uh, which took place uh, after the Black Plague, that entheogens begin to disappear from Christian art. And, and what we realized was, look, the Black Plague was the greatest natural disaster in human history. I mean, it wiped out, depending on your estimate, 50% to 60, 70% of the entire population of Europe at that time. Uh, it starts about 1347 and ends in 1352. So it burned through Europe. And there were several other outbreaks later on. This is the point, and in the image we discuss what is the real meaning of St. George and the Dragon. This is the point at which the wise women, who were the healers and who had the knowledge of the herbs, the entheogens, the plants that could heal midwifery, this is when the wise women who carried this tradition throughout Europe became branded as the satanic witches of the Inquisition. This is when the ointments and herbs that they used became known uh, as the witch's ointment. And this is the point where uh, the, uh, the Pope issues a, a, a papal bull saying that uh, it is all right to um, condemn and to torture and to burn uh, heretics and witches. So this is really the, the, uh, the turning point. And this is why this arose, because the church, had, you know, if it was it had the direct connection to God, it could not protect the faithful from the Black Plague, so it had to find a scapegoat. And it was mainly the wise women and the witches, and this is how this came about. So in the Vatican museums, which are mainly from the period of the late Middle Ages uh, on, uh, you know, from, from um, you know, going in towards the Renaissance period, from about 1350 to the 1500s, this is where the entheogens disappear from Christian art. And they could not remove what was done before, but they certainly sent a chilling message that um, these kind of pagan and satanic images would not be tolerated any longer. You know, you posed a great question in the book to Charles Inslee, who's a senior lecturer in medieval history and who's the keeper of the great Canterbury Psalter replica at the at Christ Church University in Canterbury. So I'm going to pose that same question to you now. What do you think, Jerry, of the silence of the art historians and theologians on these sacred psychoactive images, not just in the great Canterbury Psalter, but in Christian art in general? I think... Uh... Well, and I just want to say, the key word there is replica, because we received permission. The, the, the great Canterbury Psalter <laughs> went through an, an incredible odyssey uh, in the hands of different royal patrons uh, before it ended up in the hands of none other than Napoleon Bonaparte, who put it in the... National Library of France, uh, and that's where it remains today. So basically, uh, what happens here is that we examined and were given permission and sent the original images of the, uh, the great Canterbury Psalter. So there's only one of those, and it's under lock and key um, at uh, in the in the in Paris in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, so that's the first point that I want to make. However, there are replicas which were made by the Spanish um, high quality art uh, publishing company that makes exact replicas. By that I mean, if there's a coffee stain on the page, they reproduce the coffee stain. So that's what we found. Now I asked uh, Professor Morgan. Uh, who is an art historian at Cambridge, who wrote one of the commentaries that was published with Molero's um, uh, replica of the great Canterbury Psalter.
Walter, what in a, in a phone call, um, because Professor Inslee suggested to me that it was very important to get his opinion. He was definitely an expert on the Psalter and on uh, the um, on, on illuminated manuscripts in general. What do you think about the mushrooms in the, this um, God Creates Plants? And there was a kind of uncomfortable pause on the phone. I believe he was consulting his his, Canter, his um, copy of the Canterbury Psalter. And he came back to me and he said, you know, I wouldn't know a mushroom if I saw one. And this is the problem because ethnobotanists don't speak to art historians and art historians don't know ethnobotany. So even the art historian, um, who a very distinguished one who did an extensive study of wall paintings and frescoes in central France, uh, she did not recognize the psilocybin mushrooms in the church of St. Martin, the Vic there. So what happens here is a lack of, of cross-disciplinary studies that has hindered this field. And we hope that this our work will um, inspire um, an interdisciplinary study. In fact, since our, our study and our work is so controversial, in the appendix to this book, we call for the establishment of an interdisciplinary on the psychedelic gospels. Look, Ryan, if our work is correct, then we're going to have to revisit what we know about the origins of Christianity and possibly the use of entheogens by Jesus to inspire his, his own awareness of his divinity and his immortality. And these are highly controversial statements, and therefore we uh, do not want the world simply to rely on our findings, although we hope it will be uh, a key study in this area. We call for the creation of an interdisciplinary committee on the psychedelic gospels to draw on people from multiple fields um, and to examine these images, not only in our books, but the multiple images that exist throughout churches and cathedrals in the Middle East and in Europe, to examine them, to vet them, to verify them, and to look at this with the same rigor that's been applied to the Gnostic Gospels and to the Dead Sea Scrolls, and to make this whole examination transparent, to put up the findings and the discussions online, so that there will be a an, an much-needed interdisciplinary examination and communication uh, on this topic. Uh, because if this is true, it requires uh, a revisiting of, of Christian history and, and other religious histories. And it also uh, requires that many people who think that you know only meditation can give you these, these sort of cosmic uh, consciousness and, and, and expansive mind um, could revisit these ancient portholes uh, to divinity and expanded consciousness. How confident are you then that your work is correct? And have you thought about the impact this would have on not only the world at large, but on individuals who, if presented with this, would have their belief system completely altered? Let me start out with the beginnings, the first part. We are highly confident of the presence of psychedelics in early and medieval Christian art, which indicates that they were known and that they were used for the initiative, initiates to have a direct existential experience of divinity. And that's a phenomenal thing that to add on top of scripture and the rituals of the sacraments that you, by imbibing in these plants, which are known throughout history and also in scientific experience, to open up the mystical world to people. When it comes to the time of Jesus and the disciples, we do not have smoking gun evidence. However, we find a plausible case can be made by revisiting the Gnostic Gospels and the uh, New Testament Gospels that these plants were also known to Jesus and the disciples. And I can cite you, but we don't have time, chapter and verse from our, our, our chapter on Kingdom of Heaven, where we interpret these passages. So there, there's no smoking gun, but we make a plausible case, and we ask people to look at it with an open mind. The impact here is we do not feel that this is in any way contradictory to belief. In fact, 
if we believe that there is the possibility of an entheogen reformation that will take place as people realize that in addition to scripture and, and sacramental ritual, that they can have a direct experience of the divine. For example, Catholic brother David Stendhal Rost, who is from the Order of St. Benedict, uh, has written uh, endorsing the possibility of psychedelics. And more than the possibility, he says, and I quote, pretty much quote or paraphrase, if I can experience God on a mountaintop through a sunset, then why not through a mushroom, prayerfully ingested, end of quote. And, and why not? These are all God's creations. These plants were, were put here by God, as was all of this phenomena. And number two, there is a thriving entheogenic cult known popularly uh, as uh, Santo Dime in Brazil. He uses uh, ayahuasca, which contains the powerful entheogen DMT, uh, also known as the visionary vine in Brazil. Uh, there is a thriving church movement that uses DMT, uh, uses ayahuasca in its rituals, and that's become quite popular, ecotourism to ayahuasca experiences in the Amazon. This church of, of Santo Dime is sanctioned by the Brazilian bishops. So here we have the use of an ancient entheogen, brew of ayahuasca, used in a modern Catholic movement endorsed by the bishops of Brazil. So we don't see this as a fundamental challenge. We hope it will reintroduce uh, Catholics to something that was part of early Christianity. And it's not only there, we think it's also in Judaism, obviously, and we say in the book, we could not uh, incorporate all of this. And we find it at the core of many religions, classical religions like um, Hinduism, and at the fundamental roots through the Eleusinian mysteries of Western civilization. So, uh, yes, it is controversial. Yes, it will require people to expand their thinking. But at the end of the day, we do not believe it is contradictory uh, to the fundamental theology of Christianity or other uh, religions. Well, what you guys have done here, Jerry, is thought-provoking, compelling, and it's obviously well-documented. And it's something that could completely change the story of not just religion, but of humanity itself, if you really think about it. So the book, again, is The Psychedelic Gospels, The Secret History of Hallucinogens and Christianity, uh, psychedelicgospels.com, and also on Amazon. So Jerry Brown, hey, thanks for your time. I really do appreciate it. Brian, it's a pleasure. I, I truly, Julie and I, thank you for the opportunity to discuss this work with you and your listeners. All right, there you have it. My thanks again to Dr. Jerry Brown. You can check out his work at psychedelicgospels.com or buy his book on Amazon. There's a link in the show notes to both if you're interested. You know, the origins of Christianity, the biblical story of Christ, that's never really resonated with me personally. But I'm not saying I agree completely with what Dr. Brown has presented here because I haven't experienced it for myself. That's a big thing for me. Verifiable, first-hand personal accounts. I haven't seen this artwork live and in color. I'm also weary of things that have been replicated or restored because how does anyone really know if they were replicated accurately? What does resonate with me, though, is this idea that we all have access to the divine, to our own divinity, and that there are different ways to experience it, whether it's through something like intense meditation, or kundalini yoga, or the ingestion of psychedelic plants. I think that's the major takeaway from the story of Christ. We all have the kingdom of God within us. I think that's what I was getting to in my introduction. You just have to plunge into that abyss, because it's there, waiting to be discovered. I mean, everything you've ever wanted is on the other side of fear. At least that's what a meme on Instagram told me earlier. You know, there is one aspect to this story that does merit further consideration and speculation, and that's the story of Gordon Wasson. There's a lot more to this dude than what's on the surface, and what's on the surface is compelling enough. I mean, he's a J.P. Morgan executive who was smack dab in the middle of the psychedelic movement of the 1960s. And he was literally the Pope's banker. He was the account manager for the Vatican while at J.P. Morgan. So it's pretty obvious why his own research didn't quite go the distance that it could have. Now that nugget is in Dr. Brown's book. We didn't really get too much into it because it does take us away from Dr. Brown and his wife's discoveries. 
But what's not in his book is a few other extra tidbits. Wasson's actual executive title at J.P. Morgan was the Vice President of Public Relations, or as it probably should be called, the Vice President of Corporate Propaganda. So what's the VP of PR? What's he doing managing accounts? Well, dig a little deeper, and you find out that Wasson has CIA ties, possible MK Ultra ties, and was the chairman at one time of the Council on Foreign Relations. I mean, this guy's deep state connections, well, they run pretty deep. I plan on digging more into Wasson and his story on a future episode. I've already started doing a lot of research on this, so more to come on that front. Until then, my gratitude and my love to all of you who chose to spend your time here with me. This is O'Culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, question authority, grant yourself the permission to feel again, and let go.